don't know if any of you have noticed this about Konami, but Suikoden and Gomon aside, it seems not only do all their big titles appeal more to American taste, but to those of the rugged alpha male persuasion. I mean, look at Contra, two of the manliest of men pumping everything in sight full of fucking lead. Variety is saying too shabby in the manly instinct of blowing the fuck away everything that moves department. Silent Hill's a franchise that's actually set in America, and five times out of six, it's all about a man conquering his demons and the demons of an entire godforsaken town. Even Konami games that were only available in Japan for a long time seem geared toward the manliest of men. One need look no further than Metal Gear 2, with longtime badass Solid Snake toting around everything from submachine guns to surf to air missiles. Other Japan-only games had... had... Yes, this is Bio Miracle Bakute Upa, starring Konami's youngest hero ever. Upa is some prince out to reclaim his seriously messed up kingdom from some goat demon called Zai. He'll have to travel through seven worlds, each with three levels and a different theme, starting out with... with... Okay, some of you know I'm studying for a medical career, but son of a bitch, even I can't come up with a diabetes joke scything enough for this first world's bakery and candy motif. Anyway, this baby is conveniently armed with a magic rattle, which causes enemies to inflate like balloons. Then, you can use them as platforms, or send them careening into other enemies. This is key to reaching higher areas for power-ups, and defeating the bosses at the end of each level. Like the recurring Birdos in Super Mario Bros. 2, you will usually face these asshole pigs, and you gotta inflate the minions they spit out and angle the shots back up to them. Sound-wise, there's this one theme that plays for a majority of the levels. It's no vampire killer, but I dare say it's one of Konami's catchiest tracks, and the game's sound effects are superb. Graphically, it's as detailed as you could hope for from a 1988 8-bit game, with each world's theme beautifully represented. Just look at the motherboardy backdrop for the fourth world, not to mention the reverse gravity in 4-2. This was well before Sonic's trippy romp through the Death Egg. Believe it or not, Konami actually wanted this game put on the American market, and it's truly a shame Upa was turned down. Some still say it was too damn weird for us Americans, but I say that's a bunch of Dodongo diarrhea, when one considers the market was more or less revitalized by a fat Italian plumber from Brooklyn, jumping around on turtles and fungus and shit. What the ass is up with these flamethrowers, though? A tad violent for such a cheery game, don't you think? Makes one suspect that parenting is a tad lax in Upa's kingdom. And then seeing the bugger crawl around the school supplies themed World 5 with the giant paste jars, that really drove it home. It's no Castlevania or Contra in terms of hard assery, but do not be deceived by the PBS Kids veneer. Upa has a near perfect difficulty curve. The first four worlds are relatively simple, but once you hit World 5, plenty of extra shit gets thrown your way. Literally. Look at these flying dirty diapers that get dropped on Upa. Every baby's worst nightmare! World 6 is where the game can get quite brutal, though. Yee! Invincibility period! You pig motherfuckers are gonna cry wee 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 all the way home, bitches! Yes, I am God here! I am unstoppable! I am- Ah, oh, shit! The hideaway for 6-1's pig probably gets my vote for the most asinine. This one tiny spot is where I had the most success angling shots, but if I wait too long, they'll go up into that spike gap in the ceiling! Then there's this asinine jump in the middle of 6-3, I've never gotten over that wall using an inflated goon, and believe me, I've tried, so I have to rely on bouncing off the gelatin. Come on, come on, come on, Upa, we can do this. Come on, yeah, yeah, that's high enough, you got it, you got it, you got it, ah, fuck you, you're an asshole. What comes next is a whole flock of birds coming in at supersonic speed, and if you survive all that, this world faces you off against a floating pig on a cloud that shits out lightning, all the while you're bouncing around on fucking jello. Patience is the key with this one, because it's a crapshoot whether or not your angled shots will connect. If you survive all that, World 7 starts you off with a level where you must drop down, and half the time these green spikes will be there to impale your perfectly smooth baby's bottom. The rest of the world is a fucking marathon run, and... Oh, did I mention that for stages scrolling up? That classic Kid Icarus bullshit is in effect? <sighs> yeah... Thankfully, the overall control is solid, but there are a couple sticky issues. 
Namely, if Upa falls too far, he'll land flat on his ass, leaving him wide open or worse. Secondly, it's kind of hard to hit inflated enemies so they fly off at an angle instead of straight ahead, which can have disastrous consequences when you screw up. Bitching aside, let me repeat that I regret never playing this on an NES in my youth, especially when Konami could have easily done it. I mean, they had some rights to the Simpsons license, making that shit awesome arcade game where the whole family rushes to Maggie's rescue. Why not do what Nintendo did with turning Doki Doki Panic into Super Mario Bros. 2 and give the game a Simpsons coat of paint, giving Maggie her own game? I mean, that baby still rivals Stewie Griffin in terms of unfuckwithableness. But alas, now it's available on Virtual Console, and I give it an 8 out of 10. It's just too bad there were never any sequels. All there was was, outside of using the OOPA concept in a Parodius game or two, a re-release on cartridge in 1993. The version seen here for the Virtual Console was on the Famicom Disk System. But when it comes to Konami platformers released back in 1993 only in Japan, now conveniently available for the Virtual Console on Wii, there's one big stinkin' hunk of monkey fucking cheese that stands alone. That's right, Rondo of Blood, baby! It's all about the centennial revival of Count Dracula, the one that comes after Simon Belmont's original romp. For the direct predecessor to Symphony of the Night, it's Richter Belmont's job to whip it good. Just like in Symphony of the Night, though, Dracula has some help in the form of this douche shaft. Now it seems everyone falls into the trap of making a crack about the shaft TV show, even AVGN and Necro VMX. But somehow, it bothers no one that we have a villain called Shaft who attacks with two giant magic balls. Because I could never get anywhere with TurboGrafx CD emulation, my first taste of this game's genius came in that PSP pack where you must start with the remake. To me, the remake was just eh. It had me wondering what the big fucking deal was, especially since Super Castlevania 4 was such an awesome reimagining of the original. Then I unlocked the original version and never looked back. I was in for one hell of a 2D sugar rush, and Rondo of Blood has been my favorite traditional Castlevania ever since. Many lament the loss of Castlevania 4's more fluid control, especially the 8-way whipping action, but to me it wasn't that big a deal. Richter's controls are nowhere near as stiff as the NES games, plus he's got a back click to get out of tight spots and reach higher platforms, and the addition of the item crash more than makes up for taking out the 8-way whipping, consuming a large amount of hearts for a wicked super attack with your sub-weapon. Oh hell yes, the power of Christ compels you, bitch! Plus, Rondo of Blood reintroduced the best things about Castlevania 3, my second favorite traditional game in the franchise, the first of which is having multiple characters. Part of the plot involves finding and rescuing four maidens, and the first you can free is Richter's sister-in-law, Maria Renard, or as I like to call her, Sailor Venus's stunt double. From that point on, she's a playable character, out to infect everyone with bird flu and her sub-weapons represent her guardian spirits, the four celestial beasts of Chinese mythology. The second thing brought back are the branching paths. Just about every stage has a hidden path that leads to an alternate route, and though some are pretty damn obscure, who the hell would think that causing this spiked ball to fall would open up a path to the alternate boss for the alternate third stage? Nevertheless, between all the hidden paths and maidens you need to find, there's plenty to do. It's as Metroid-y as Castlevania can get without actually being structured like Metroid. Another reason I feel Rondo of Blood makes for the best old-school Castlevania was that here, I think Konami finally got the difficulty curve just right. Castlevania 1 and 3 on the NES are notoriously savage, but Castlevania 4 made things a bit too easy with its control scheme. Here, Konami found the franchise's Goldilocks zone. Don't get me wrong, making your way to Dracula as Richter is hard as shit, but never as overwhelmingly frustrating as Castlevania 1 or 3 could get. But the game sure does try in some places. Oh, this cocksmoker always nabs my sub-weapon. Oh, not this time. This time I'm gonna get- Oh, you son of a bitch! Now there's no way to drop that rock to carry me up to this alternate boss. You can easily do it as Maria with her double jump, but I needed the axe as Richter! Okay, a cross can easily take care of a swarm of bats. Oh great, another one's coming, another cross should do it, and- Oh! Owned by a goddamn bat! 
Thankfully, if you find this game too hard, you still got Maria. Her doves just rape everything, and her double jump is incredibly useful. This Minotaur has no chance in hell against Maria Renard's doves. And watch what happens when we unleash the item crash with the dragon. It costs 50 hearts, but look at the end result. Yay! I beat the monster! Now I'm gonna spaz out like the hyperactive little tweeny bopper I am with the slide maneuver I have! Yay! That slide maneuver can also be a lifesaver. I mean, right here. This part's a pain in the ass's Richter, but it's a piece of cake with Maria. But making you play as a little girl in a pink dress if you find the game too hard, is that basically making the game too easy and shaming you by playing as a horribly lame girly girl like other games I could mention? Oh, hell no! For one thing, Maria's one drawback is that she lacks Richter's endurance, so she'll die quicker if you fuck around. Secondly, some bosses, like Death and Shaft, still take considerable effort as Maria. Though Dracula himself will always wind up as Maria's bitch. Trust me, you haven't experienced Castlevania until you've seen Dracula get pwned by said little girl in a pink dress and her animal friends. And to add insult to injury, she queefs right in the face of the Lord of Darkness. On top of that, Maria is easily one of the most adorable characters ever to grace a video game, and somehow this only enhances her bad assery. Seeing these cutscenes also drills home how idiotic some gamers are when they whine about the anime look of Don Asaro and Portrait of Ruin, since this game did so long before and still rocked the fucking ass. Speaking of the graphics, the fact that many of these sprites were reused in Symphony of the Night, and the Medusa Head sprite kept getting recycled up until Order of Ecclesia, should tell you something about Dracula X's artistic majesty. Then there's how the CD quality music raised the bar for a series already known for its bitchin' tunes. One last weird thing about Rondo of Blood that I must mention. Even though the original Castlevania was reimagined many times, it's this game that kinda feels like a remake. Seeing that opening hallway still gives me shivers of nostalgia. You fight the original's first four bosses in a row before taking on Shaft, and there's the bridge leading to Dracula that's swarming with giant bats. Even the actual battle with Dracula feels a lot like the original. Whether that's a good or a bad thing depends on whoever's playing it. Either way, this is the old school Castlevania that always has me coming back for more, and it's a crime against humanity to give this game anything less than a 9 out of 10. And so that's it for my holiday themed double feature and my last big video for the year. I'd like to take this moment to wish everyone happy holidays, hope you're enjoying time with your families, and hope you're looking forward to 2011, because I know if I sure as shit am, because I'm glad that 2010 is pretty much done taking a big old dump on my life, and it's found more ways to do that than one. I don't know how many of these videos I'll be making in 2011, I got to get my, a lot of shit in my life back together, but hope you at least enjoyed this one, what I've done so far this year, and... I'm at.